Russell Valentino, um, professor of Slavic languages and literatures and chair of Slavic languages and literatures. That's still correct, right? Correct. Uh, at Indiana University. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Russell. There's a lot to tell you about Russell, but I'll start. Um, I'll start with his uh, with, with his uh, research accomplishments. He's the author of two scholarly monographs and the translator of seven books of literature from Italian, Russian, and Croatian, including uh, Fulvio Tomica uh, Materada, Savit Magaliev, The Silence of the Fuli, Predrag Vardelic is the other Venice. He served as editor-in-chief of the Iowa, Iowa Review from 2009 to 2013, and is currently the president of the American Literary Translator Association, senior editor at Autumn Hill Books, and professor and chair of Slavic and European Languages and Cultures, I forgot the cultures. Um, at Indiana University. Never University. forget the cultures. I <laughs> can't forget the cultures. Um, his essays and short translations have appeared in um, many publications, including Defunct, which is a nice place to start, um, Modern Fiction Studies, 91st Meridian, Del Sol Review, The Iowa Review, Asia Translation Review, and Slavic Review. His most recent books include the co-edited with uh, Esther Allen and Sean Carter volume, The Man Between, Michael Henry Heim and the Life and Translations from Open Letter Books, and the monograph, The Woman in the Widow, The Woman in the Widow, the Woman in the Window, Ohio State University Press, both published in October of 2014. Um, so, and his reviews, essays, and short fiction, poetry, and translations have appeared in a wide variety of literary magazines and scholarly journals. Um, he's, been, uh, he's the founder and, and senior editor of Autumn Hill Books, a contributing editor of the Iowa Review, recipient of two Fulbright Faculty Research Awards, um, and of an NEA Literature Fellowship for Translation in Prose and then in Poetry. Um, and so on and so forth. He's been, so in other words, he's had um, quite, a, um, quite an accomplished career so far. Um, <laughs> I'm very happy to have Russell here because uh, Russell and I go, go way back, first to my hearing wonderful things about him from mutual friends, and then through our um, solidarity and suffering at an NEH uh, summer seminar at Northwestern on Utopias, um, where uh, I don't know if I kept you sane, but you definitely kept me sort of same. Um, 1993? 1993? Six, five, five, I think. Yeah, 1994. Four, 1994. Yeah. Yes, it was quite a while ago. Um, it was very informative. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and formative. It was informative. <laughs> it was a great deal. Um, so, um, so Russell used to, for, for a long time, was at University of Iowa and recently made the jump to uh, Indiana University, which I think is um, a wonderful thing. I don't know how wonderful it is for Russell, but it's a great thing for the, for the university, and it's nice to have him um, a little bit closer to the East Coast. Um, and today yeah. he's going to talk about his book, uh, or give, present, give a presentation from his book, The Woman in the Window. So, thank you. Thank you, Elliot. Um, thank you for coming on this Friday afternoon. Um, so thank you to Elliot for inviting me, and Heather um, Jansen for the logi logistical support. Um, so I, I am going to be talking about this book, um, I'll have hold it up here so you can see what it is, and it's kind of that. That's not the whole cover, but it gives you a little close-up of the of the image that's that's on the cover. Um, so uh, this this title snuck up on me um, after about nine years of writing or so, um, when I realized w she was in all the books and all the films that I was writing about, um, and so I felt rather compelled to call the book. The woman in the window. She seemed to be insisting on it. Um, so the, this makes it sound a little bit, the woman in the window makes it sound a little bit like um, Fritz Lang's film. Uh, I realize in my book is about that only indirectly. Um, I suppose it's hard for a book not to be about male fantasies on some level uh, or other and reflections of oneself in commercial store windows and dreaming about other possible lives from the one you've lived. This is all The Woman in the Window, Fritz Lang's version. Um, oh, I suppose my book is mostly about that, but I wasn't thinking about that as I was writing it. Uh, and Lang's film is based on a book uh, which is called Once Off Guard uh, by a, a writer named J.H. Wallace, who was uh, a writer, an Iowa writer, I believe. And I took a look at his book in special collections at the University of Iowa when I was there some years ago. Um, the character played by Edward G. Robinson in the film is a psychology professor, but he's, of course, an English professor in the book. Um, and this, I think, makes a difference and is akin to the transformation of Prospero's magic from the Tempest into the collective id that destroys the civilization of the Krell in um, 
Forbidden Planet. Uh, both are products of mid 20th century Freudianism. Uh, at least they made the Walter Pigeon character pi pi pictured here, Dr. Morbius, a philologist rather than a psychologist. Both moreover play on the notion of consensual fantasy, which I'll get to in a minute. In looking for images of the book, for the book cover, I stumbled upon something more surprising um, and both surprising and disturbing. Most of the images that come up through the various major search engines, if you enter the woman in the window, that phrase, are of a particular sort. I'm not talking about pornography. When I was, what I was looking for were images in which a man is standing before an imposing facade, probably stone, but at least tallish and dark and rather cold looking, from which a woman looks out from a window up above. Or there might just be a window and no woman, but we all know that she's back there behind the casement somewhere, just as we know this image in our minds. It's at least Shakespearean, maybe medieval. It's a little like this, which is a, a still from uh, the Italian 1990s film uh, Cinema Paradiso. Um, and if you start trying to think of examples from various famous and non-famous books and then films on top of that, it's hard to stop. Um, this is where the title of the book comes from. But, as I said, it's hard to find images from that angle. Uh, most of the women, most of them are women at a window but seen from inside by someone in the room with her. This is not at all the same thing. This was the surprising part. Why it should be disturbing, if not depressing, comes from the analysis of one of the treatments of the woman in the window trope that I explore in the book. When Humbert Humbert looks at Lolita at the window, he is in the room with her, spying on her, noting down aspects of his perverse infatuation in tiny scribbles in a notebook that he keeps hidden and locked inside his desk. He looks at her as she leans over the casement talking with Kenneth Knight, a boy from her class who has exactly the right sort of name to be standing below her window in the traditional pose. And he realizes that he, Humbert, is seeing her somehow incorrectly. It was as if, he admits, he were seeing her through the wrong end of a telescope. Nabokov was a very smart writer. He knew how to work a trope. He also understood what was gathered up inside this particular one, and he destroys it and all that's supposedly inside it in his lovely and terrible book. What does it say about our society that looking at her through the wrong end of a telescope from spying on her, in effect, from inside her room is no longer perverse but utterly mundane? This question was an afterthought. It's not in the book, but it could have been. The tone is right. My talk has a subtitle, Commerce, Consensual Fantasy, and the Quest for Masculine Character from Dostoevsky to Nabokov. This is a variation on the actual subtitle of the book, uh, which is Commerce, uh, Consensual Fantasy, and the Quest for Masculine Virtue in the Russian novel, because I do a little bit more in the book. Um, a little conceptual background about the subtitle will help to explain my point of departure. Let's see if I have, there it is. Um, my point of departure, um, I hope if, uh, if not, there will be then some time for questions at the end, and you can ask, I hope you do. So this part's a little bit thick. This is the conceptual background. I'll try to read it not too fast. Um, please bear with me. With the European financial revolution of the late 17th and early 18th centuries, the creation of the Bank of England, public national governmental debt, and the gradual replacement of landed interests by moneyed interests, the notion of a man's virtue in property began to give way before m more liquid conceptions of the self. This was the transformation that John Pocock addressed in his writings of the 1970s and 80s, most notably the Machiavellian moment and virtue, commerce, and history. While he ended his discussion in the 18th century, the path of thought he traced should be of interest to readers today, for in the last 35 to 40 years, we have uncannily replayed in the digital revolution the reactions he explored in the financial. The rise and spread of forms of consensually determined values such as credit and publicly owned stock in early 18th century England suggested a fantastical foundation to social well-being that some heralded as liberation, the promise of future worth, 
and others bemoaned as the onset of both moral and political corruption. Similarly, apologists for virtuality in our own day have seen in it at least as much, if not more, potential for future well-being, both individual and collective, as their early modern counterparts saw in credit, while concerns about the corrosive influence of digital phenomena have tended to fall into two types, some focusing on the moral life of the individual, others on the health and sickness of the polity. The growth of credit in the early 18th century gave rise to a counter discourse in which virtue moralists argued for the solidity of property over the corruption of consensually determined fantastical values like money or stock, paper money in particular. I used to think we had not seen an explicit virtue movement in reaction to the rise of virtuality in our own day. I suspected that the word virtue had become overly quaint, academic, gendered, or politically overcharged or by contrast that the sign might have simply lost all its freshness and become hackneyed and vapid. Having worked on this topic, on this project, however, I should say that while not unitary, virtue theory and virtue discourse have seen a marked resurgence in the past 35 years, with Deidre McCluskey's projected multi-volume work on the bourgeois virtues as only one of the latest in an impressive, diverse, and still growing array. I believe she's published two of those and a third, maybe a fourth, are on the way. There are various in incarnations of this idea of bourgeois virtue, and they're all published at the uh, University of Chicago. By once again resurrecting this old word, I want to suggest that the conceptual thread from the bodily foundations of virtue to the absent body of virtuality are implicit in the term's usage, even when not articulated explicitly, and that the gradual decorporealization of value in modern life is largely responsible for the continued intensity of virtue talk today. In other words, People want to talk about virtue still, and perhaps especially now, because they feel it questioned fundamentally in the rise and spread of the virtual. Human reactions to the increasing centrality of this symbolic public order range from euphoria to madness with an aggregate of mild stimulation or anxiety in the center. Thus, consensual fantasy may be seen as a beneficent harnessing or a malevolent unleashing of the power of human thought. And this dichotomy shares a basic similarity with the arguments about credit in early modern times. That is where I get my subtitle uh, and the point of departure for this analysis. Okay, so I'm going to start with um, uh, an 1846 book um, by Dostoevsky uh, called The Double, where the author concentrates, this is my argument, the author concentrates the fantastical potential, potential of modern commercial culture in the mind of a single individual. Yakov Petrovich Galyadkin begins his journey by fantasizing about his paper bank notes. He toys with the trappings of wealth to create an image of himself as, pro as prosperous in the eyes of others. The split that then takes place in him as a result of this wholehearted acceptance of 1840s modernity is merely a coming to terms with the trade-off that his complicity necessitates. The, the double and the confidence man thus merge through the creation and subsequent acceptance of the mask, the public self, as a substitute for the real thing. In this interpretation, Dostoevsky's story, story may be seen as yet another history of the moral or spiritual decay that accompanies the rise of modern commercial culture. As the growth of social dependence in the forms of salaried office, personal and professional patronage, the exchange of forms of mobile property and modes of consciousness suited to a world of moving objects with fluct fluctuating values, all point to a fundamental transformation in the social and political life of the individual. The forms of property embraced by Galyatkin, moreover, are precisely those most opposed to the agrarian ideal. From a landed standpoint, the masculine character that Galyatkin is in the process of constructing for himself is founded upon fantastical, imaginary forms of property, and a vision of the self as fundamentally alterable according to one's circumstances. I'll return to this in a bit. To the dual questions of what one might forego beyond psychological integrity, the guy goes crazy, by coming to terms with such a commerce-inflected world, and what might constitute an appropriate rebellion against it, this early work of Dostoevsky furnishes intriguing responses. The first dovetails with what Albert Hirschman in, uh, has called the romantic critique of the bourgeois order, which from Fourier and Marx to Freud and Weber portrays the triumph of the ideology of self-interest, the drive belt of progress in the Western world, self-interest, 
portrays that ideology as an impoverishment of the full human personality. In this line of thinking, we moderns long ago lost the Schiller-esque beauty of soul that made our predecessors capable of appreciating and living life in all its fullness. For Dostoevsky, particularly in his pre-exile humanist phase, this approach rings true, given the conditions of early 19th century Russian society with its entrenched serfdom and dehumanizing bureaucracy. Galyatkin's complicity in the modern world, his desire to raise himself in it through the manipulation of his public persona, may be seen, therefore, as an impoverishment of his humanity, depicted as a fundamental split. More centrally for this discussion, the sense of humanity's moral diminution has long been related in European thought to a perceived loss of heroism, particularly as a chivalric, aristocratic ideal in modern times when striving for honor and glory comes to seem anachronistic, if not ridiculous, in any but a historical or maybe a military context. Dostoevsky gestures toward the lost chivalric mode many times, most notably by having his hero look up to the window behind which Clara Alsufievna supposedly awaits him, thereby invoking the gaze of the devoted knight toward his inspiration. What looks back from the window, however, is not his beloved, or at least not the beloved woman Galyatkin expects. Instead, it is a purely public gaze. And this is a quote from the book. Suddenly, in all the windows at once, a strange commotion took place. Figures appeared, curtains opened, entire groups of people rushed to Alsufi Ivanovich's windows, all looking for something in the courtyard. From the safety of his wood pile of, uh, fire, pile of fire, firewood, our hero, in turn, began following the general commotion with curiosity and stretched his head from right to left as far as the little shadow of the wood pile concealing him would allow. He froze all at once, shivered, and all but sat down on the ground from fright. It occurred to him, in a word he guessed it with all his being, that they weren't looking for something or someone, they were looking for him, Mr. Goyatkin. Now everyone is looking, pointing in his direction. Suddenly they have all seen him all at once and are waving at him, nodding toward him, saying his name. This substitution of public evaluation for the approval of an exalted, untouchable woman is a masterstroke of literary transfiguration. By, by means of which all the tainted, ambitious motives, motives of the hero are stripped of their idealist veneer. To, utter, to the utterly confused Galyatkin Sr. does not have the conceptual wherewithal to comprehend that what emerges from the hall to meet him in the next moment is not an alien enemy twin, but the public self his own desires and fantasies have unleashed, the same desires and fantasies contained in the banknotes of the opening pages. The woman in the window is often not a character in the usual sense of that word, for she is devoid of her own content, let alone her own agency. She was also rather static, both temporally and spatially. These marked absences are partly what transforms the, what transformed the trope, which is of course quite old, into a modern literary, and I would claim social construction. She is first of all, a face value, a floating currency, a, a printed character on a page, filled with the fancy and agreement of those who trade in her. In this, she exemplifies an older set of reading practices, flatter and less pregnant. Her inaccessible distance is essential. Her desire, not so much. She can want the hero or not. It's not that important. She anchors him by her emptiness, her ample readiness to accommodate his fantasy and ours, to make it in and of, to, to take it in and safeguard it, preferably in rigid confines. A convent cell does nicely, or an attic room in the home of a tyrannical parent or guardian. For an exalted figure, she is surprisingly common in the 19th century. She appears, and the 20th, she appears as Lucy Manette at the end of Dickens's A Tale of Two Cities, invisible behind the window that Sidney Carton gazes at before sacrificing himself for her happiness. In Turgenev's A Nest of the Gentry, she is Lisa, whose handheld candle Lavretsky spies from the garden on their one enchanted evening together. In War and Peace, she is Natasha, unseen, but, but again, but overheard from the window above the room, above his room by Aunt Prince Andre and a night that changes their lives forever. In Henry James as the American, she is Madame de saint Ray, locked behind the walls of the Carmelite convent, which Christopher Newman looks up to longingly or in his best imitation of such an emotion. Dreiser's Caroline Niebuhr is in her window when a destitute and aged Hurstwood glances up from the street below in one of the final scenes of Sister Carrie. You need some water? Here's some water right there. Grab it. 
um, Sister Carrie Levin, Constantine Levin, is lost in Anna Karenina when he sees her through Kitty's carriage window in a clear echo of the Gogol scene from 30 years before in Dead Souls. The trope is so expected that it might even be created in retrospect, as in Nikita Mikhalkov's 1979 film adaptation of Goncharov's Oblomov, which contains a magical scene of the hero gazing up to Olga's window that is not in the novel. Then there are the variations and reversals. A reborn Raskolnikov looks up, glimpsed in the infirmary window by Sonia, who's standing in the courtyard looking up at him, uh, as she stands in the prison yard in a moment of nearly divine revelation for her. A woman looking out on the soldiers, looking up at her in Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Nor is she limited to literary depictions, nor does she disappear with the, end, the 19th century's end, as Zhivago, Cinema Paradiso, Olivier, Olivier, Lolita, and myriad other examples <coughs> make clear. Looking for her incarnations and finding her shadows, and as you think, I could say people are writing things down, and you're thinking of examples, I know, this always happens. Oh yeah, there's another one, there's another one. Um, Looking for her incarnation, uh, incarnations and finding her shadows is likely to be an entertaining parlor game. Understanding what she is doing so prominently displayed in such a variety of centrally important works of the century and a half of science and revolutions is a more serious undertaking. Let me suggest that she is an evocation of the masculine heroic ethos and of that ethos in opposition to an image of compromised and searching masculinity. She gets a modern facelift in the early 19th century and multiple makeovers from then on. Exactly where she begins is hard to know, for this is not simply a case of first attestations. The trope is far too old for that. I have in mind a rebirth or transformation, an old trope for a new age. For this reason, as a modern phenomenon, she needs to be understood in relation to the other two figures with whom I've located her, um, the confidence man and the double. She is part of their story and they are part of hers, three stalwart traveling companions. She materializes somewhere between the unspoiled potential that Nikolai Gogol's confident hero imagines in The Governor's Daughter in Dead Souls and the ambitious fantasy or the fantastical ambition that Dostoevsky's Goliadkin imagines in Clara Alsupievna. In its most robust formulation, a knight looks up to her window. That Dostoevsky knows as much is suggested by the geneal genealogical key Galyatkin provides as his thoughts wander on that stormy Petersburg night when he contemplates meeting her. Come, she says, be happy. Be under my window in a carriage, she says, at a certain time and sing a touching Spanish serenade. I am waiting for you, and I know you love me, and we will run away together and live in a little wooden hut. But really, it simply can't be done. My dear madam, it's impossible. It's against the law. And in our day and age, I say, madam, nobody lives in a little wooden hut. In the first place, my charmer, my fine young lady, you won't be allowed out. And if you are, there'll be a hue and a cry after you. And you'll be put away in a convent. Then what, my dear young lady? What would you have me do then? Would you have me behave like somebody in a silly novel? Come to some nearby hill slope? Dissolve in tears at the sight of the cold, indifferent walls that imprison you? And finally follow the examples of certain ger bad German poets and novelists and die? Is that it, madam? Layers of fantasy and multiply and divide as Galyatkin Sr. polemicizes with his projected idea of her in her window, filtered in the end through the poetry of Schiller's and Zhukovsky's Night of Togenburg. I think that's what the reference is to, you know, it's to that particular uh, ballad. He thus upbraids his self-projection of her, uh, his self-projection uh, for having a literary conception of the relations of people nowadays in our industrial age, in our individual age, playing on the cliché of the corruption of feminine morals through excessive novel reading. She holds his fantasies multiple times over, his desires for a point of security amid modern flux, someone to fix his unwavering gaze upon, his unacknowledged hopes to raise himself through marriage to the daughter of a superior and his fears of the social corruption brought on by the spread of fantasy itself. The retiring, conscientious Galyatkin Sr. wants firmness of character, but does not see that the reason for such a desire is its concomitance with the woman in the window. The ingratiating, polymorphous Galyatkin Jr. sees such firmness as irre ir irrelevant because it clashes with the malleability, dependency, and false consciousness that make his own existence possible. His observation, moreover, that neither of them has it, firmness of character, anyway, suggests that the fall of heroism and its rejection amount to nearly the same thing, 
losing oneself in the new world and making oneself anew in it are equally unsavory. One leads to impotence, the other to disgracefulness, ugliness, bezobrazie, a word that combines aesthetic and moral categories in a manner Dostoevsky would exploit extensively in his future works. The absence to Gogol's and the young Dostoevsky's contemporaries was palpable in either case. It was anchored amid the, amid the vicissitudes of the new world, counterweighted against the insatiable fancies of modern social life with firmness of character, frank and open character, strength of character. In short, character with a capital C, one, not two or more, neither fragmented nor divided. This is the virtuous man. All right, so the question, I'm going to take a sip of water and I'm going to transition. So the question um, I'm following, and this is a question I follow in the book, is how the advent of the virtual man inflects the notion of the virtuous one, remnants of it at least. Um, putting it this way might seem merely clever, and portraying it as a quest might seem anachronistic, but with consensual fantasy as a middle term, especially as it developed with the rise and spread of symbolic value and modes of commercial consciousness through commercial development, the two other terms, virtuous man and virtual man, take on a different kind of weight, and the virtuous man, the man whose propertied corporeality was once thought to substantiate the health and rationality of a polity, that man's character is called into question. So this quest conflates with the question, what sort of character steps forward when the virtuous man has passed out of sight? And you will remember that the virtuous man, the Dabradisny Chelevek, is dismissed by Gogol in Dead Souls as a hero. He says, let's get rid of that guy. He's not doing us any good anymore. The Dabradisny Chelevek. So the virtuous man is stepping away. And that's a novel about acquisition, right? And so the, the idea of commercial enterprise, symbolic, Con consensual fantasy is implicit in the work and the displacement of the virtuous man is explicit. You get, how do you, so how do you answer this question? What sort of a man, what sort of male masculine character steps forward when this virtuous man has passed out of sight? And you get various tries at this by various authors in the remaining remainder of the 19th and I would say also into the 20th century. You get Oblomov and Stoltz, you get Raskolnikov, you get Alyosha Karamazov, and you get Konstantin Levin um, in Anna Karenina. I'm going to spend a little time with Levin because he's a great example. Um, in some measure, I think what is happening with him is a, an attempt at a revision of the classical Republican ideal, Republican with a small r, uh, a return to the virtuous man dismissed by Gogol in Dead Souls, one defined primarily by his property and not susceptible to the commercially inflected corruption of the modern paper world, paper officialdom. Um, and the way he does this is by opposing a kind of opposing that sort of world to an image of completeness or wholeness. Savashenstva uh, is the word used a lot in in Anna Karenina, um, and so that is opposed to a commercial partiality and dependency. And these two things are often uh, interwoven metaphorically with fundamental aspects of human worth amid the changing social mores throughout that are depicted in the book. With all of his morally fragmented nature, Steva Oblonsky is perhaps the most astute judge of Levin's character in this regard. He says, you are yourself an integral character, celny charakter, and you want all of life to be composed of integral phenomena, but it isn't. Just such integration lies at the heart of the virtuous ideal, which is ultimately a Socratic notion of living fullness, commitment, and purity, but also, and most importantly, independence, particularly from the growing norm of salaried bureaucratic functionalism. The, li the world that we live in, right? <laughs> so the opposition I see being played out here is between constancy, landed independence, and changeability, commercial dependency. And this maps quite easily onto the classical Republican contrast between virtue and fortune. And this is a quote uh, from Pocock. It's a little bit long, so I'll, I'll try to shorten it. The baraka, mana, or charisma, to use terms from other cultures, of the successful actor consisted both in the quality of personality that commanded good fortune and in the quality that dealt effectively and nobly with whatever fortune might send. And the Roman term for this complex characteristic was virtus. Virtue and fortune, to anglicize them, were regularly paired as opposites, and the heroic fortitude that withstood ill fortune passed in the into the active capacity that remolded circumstances to the actor's advantage. This opposition was frequently expressed in the image of a sexual relation 
a masculine active intelligence was seeking to dominate a feminine passive unpredictability which would submissively reward him for his strength or vindictively betray him for his weakness. This is obviously not just Roman, right? And you get your Shakespeare examples here too. Fortune is that strumpet that runs the wheel and drops you where, wherever she wants. Um, Levin muses about this sort of stuff all the time. And at one point in the book, just after he's had a little argument with his brother about self-interest of all things, he wonders of whether the ability to act in the service of the general good, to do philanthropic work in particular, may not be, this is a quote, a quality, but actually a lack of something. Not of honest, a good, honest, noble desires and tastes, but a lack of force of life. This is a translation of Stila Zizny what they call heart, the yearning that makes a man choose one road out of all the possible ones and desire only that. And that's the end of his quote. Levin appears to have in mind a kind of constancy and purity of action, perhaps under difficult conditions in the face of the world's changing circumstances. He appears to associate it with self-interest over philanthropy, other, other worldly, other sort of altruistic interests, and he suggests that its connection to elemental force, power, and desire for life make it a positive character trait. This has all the markings of the ancient Greek concept of thumos, or spiritedness, and Levin's attempt to zero in on a character trait whose absence might account for a tendency toward devoting oneself to the service of others suggests a response to the question of how self-interest, which was seen as a positive thing in the Western world, but not always a positive thing, usually a negative thing in the Russian world, self-interest might be considered in a positive light, even from a landed standpoint. A self-interested thumatic impulse is suggested as that thing which centers a man and gives him purpose. It tosses him an anchor or a raft amid the sea of life. To make it the sea of modern life, Tolstoy invokes the trope at the heart of my book. This is a quote. Inside, an old woman dozed in the corner, and at the window, apparently having just woken up, sat a young woman holding the ribbons of her white bonnet with both hands bright and thoughtful, filled completely with a delicate and complex inner life to which Levin was a stranger, she looked past him toward the glowing sunrise. At the very moment when that vision was about to disappear, the honest eyes focused on him. She recognized him and her face lit up with joyful surprise. He could not have been mistaken. There were no other eyes in the world like those. There was no other being in the world capable of concentrating for him all the light and meaning of life. It was she, it was Kitty. She did not look out anymore. The sound of the springs could no longer be heard. The bells grew nearly in inaudible. The barking dogs indicated that the carriage had passed through the village, and all around there remained the empty fields, the village ahead, and he himself alone and distant from it all, making his way alone down the deserted wide road. The passage has a lyrical arc with a marked orchestral punctuation at the dual phrases, it was she, it was Kitty. The scene resonates, moreover, with the man on his road passage from Gogol's Dead Souls, where a man's vision of a woman framed in a window appears suddenly and just as suddenly vanishes, the governor's daughter, when the carriages get in, uh, entangled with each other, leaving the hero stunned amid the empty fields. In Gogol's work, it is the narrator who takes the next step to wonder about the vision's meaning. In Tolstoy's, the experience is filtered through the hero's point of view. In either case, the vision serves as an impetus to action and is channel, channeled into the hero's force of life. In Tolstoy's works, moreover, however, getting the girl is never an appropriate end for such a driving impulse. Levin continues to struggle with the proper end of his own life energy even, and perhaps especially, after his marriage and the apparent filling out of his do domestic life. This problem, faced at a later stage in life by Lem Levin, is faced at an earlier one by Andrei Balkonsky in War and Peace, who appears in the early pages of the novel bored out of his wits by domestic life and primed for a leap into a life of heroic, Napoleonic, warrior-based glory. Levin, as Balkonsky before him, is in effect faced with the problem of bourgeois happiness, which of course is only a problem when the driving impulse of the male protagonist is essentially heroic in nature. Such a character is faced with the question, is this all that I am good for? Which we in turn can understand clearly as, is this all that the virtuous manly ideal amounts to? The domestic sphere casts it dar its dark shadow over the hero, who is threatened with the mundane details of an essentially procreative and therefore unheroic household. Levin and Vronsky are threatened with the power of the domestic sphere both at once, 
and their responses are contrasted systematically. This is all in part six. It all happens like you're looking at it in parallel, and Tolstoy is clearly doing it on purpose. Here's Levin, here's Vronsky, here's Levin, here's Vronsky. Um, as are those of their partners. Here's uh, Kitty in response to Levin being away. Here's, here's Anna in response to uh, Vronsky being away. Tolstoy's treatment of the problem follows historical precedent as the depiction of the du dual male protagonists, Vronsky and Levin, suggests a turn to either politics, in the case of Vronsky, or sports, in the case of Levin, as a way of exercising the heroic ethos that the domestic sphere would turn to flab. And as in the case of the inauthentic in love, a healthy marriage remains distinctly possible at this point in Tolstoy's imaginative life. It would become impossible only later with works like Kreutzer Sonata. But now it's still possible. It is indicated through the appropriate reactions of Kitty to her husband's sporty absence by contrast to the imbalanced and manipulative behavior of Anna in response to her partner's absence. The invocation of the woman in the window at this moment of Anna Karenina, a mere 20 pages after Levin's conversation with Koznyshev regarding self-interest as the basis for human well-being, makes clear the suggestion of masculine centering that is being made and the apparent redirection of the masculine heroic tradition to which the trope is connected. Viewed from a different perspective, the scene provides an answer to Kitty's search for a non-exchange relationship, one based on something other than the newfangled wears on sale approach to intimacy, to fostering intimacy among marriage-aged young people that she and her family have found so difficult to uh, adopt. Tolstoy's novel resists schematicity through the depth of its characters, but the opposition of a thumos-inspired virtue to the contemporary world's fickleness is a way of making sense of its many dichotomies. In this approach, on one side lies a completeness of character that renders one independent, capable of coping with the world's uncertainties without corruption. On the other, changeability as such, and the various dependencies on which people build facades of security to support themselves until, the real, until real life causes a collapse. The shift from landed <coughs> or virtue-based to symbolic or virtual conceptions of property afforded a wealth of such flimsy certainties to Tolstoy's readers. It would continue to do so for generations to come. It would continue to do so in the 20th century. And these are my last two examples. I'm going to use them together, the 20th century examples of, um, and you'll hear. Published within two years of each other in the mid-1950s, Lolita and Dr. Zhivago were both written by Russian authors, one in Russian, one in English, on either side of the Atlantic. Both had troubled publication histories and were surrounded by scandal. Both, had, both transformed the lives of their authors, and both stand as central markers of domestic and international cultural politics of the Cold War. Both, in turn, were adapted to the screen by major film directors, Stanley, Stanley Kubrick and David Lean, respectively, in the 1960s, with smaller budget remakes appearing in the post-Cold War 1990s and early 2000s. Such similarities are probably not enough to throw a pedophile and a poet together. Let us leave that for later. For now, it is enough to reconsider the work of their respective fictional lives, the heroes' fictional lives. While both books begin with a portrait of the artist, 10-year-old Yuri's observation of his mother's funeral, Humbert Humbert's recounting of his pivotal erotic encounter at the age of 13, um, between 10 and 13, one senses the great fulcrum. Both books end with the art itself, Yuri's poems in a separate chapter, and Humbert's revelation in the last paragraph of the work that the work we have just read is, in fact, an artistic art monument. This is a quote. That husband of yours, I hope, will always treat you well, because otherwise my specter shall come at him like black smoke, like a demented giant, and pull him apart nerve by nerve, and do not pity CQ. One had to choose between him and HH, -H, and one wanted HH -H to exist at least a couple of months longer, so as to make have him make you live in the minds of later generations. I am thinking of aurochs and angels, the secret of durable pigments, prophetic sonnets, the refuge of art. And this is the only immortality you and I may share, my, my Lolita. She is dead at this point in the story, of course, a stipulation of H.H.'s confession being made public. It was a text for others from the start, a, remem a remembrance in durable pigments. A remembrance of what exactly? Love, guilt, perversity, sickness isn't the issue. Not yet, at least. 
Lara, too, is dead when Yuri's poems about her become known to the world, just as both male characters have died by then as well, of heart failure, no less. Kubrick is most blatant in making the theme of artistic refuge central to his adaptation. Did this go to sleep again? I hope not. Oh, good. There she is. Um, Kubrick is most blatant in making the theme of artistic refuge central to its, his adaptation. In the closing moments of his film, he has Humbert Humbert fire his revolver at Claire Quilty through a painting of a woman. Apparently the same portrait lying on its side at the entrance to Pavor Manor, Quilty's cavernous mansion, as H.H. makes his way through the debris of Western culture to commit his murder. The bullets rip through the canvas on which the woman is uh, represented, beginning at the bottom and making their way up the portrait to end with her face. Quilty is sprawled on the other side, his groans audible as the bullets, having passed through the painting, presumably enter his body off camera. The scene ends with a lingering full screen of the pictured woman's face and the holes through the painting that could not protect him. So much for the refuge of art. The setting does two things well. First, it cleverly translates translates H.H.'s invocation of artistic refuge at the close of his literary confession by employing other highly filmable objects. Second, it pronounces judgment on that invocation through the room's apparent disorder and association with the moral free esthete quilty, and most effectively by having Humbert Humbert shoot holes through the woman's face, laying waste to the art as a simple byproduct of his drunken, jealous rage. In effect, uh, it is a sweeping gesture on Kubrick's part. In effect, he offers up the refuge of art line and then unveils the monstrosity that such an enterprise can become, a move that accords with the basic anti-humanist thrust of his darker film of uh, In Kubrick's version, however, H.H. destroys the woman in the window a little too definitively. The proviso needs clarity. This is James B. Harris's and Stanley Kubrick's Lolita. Nabokov's endings to both the novel and the screenplay he created on its basis, leave room for doubt as to the murderer's intent, let alone the author's in invoking artistic refuge, which is of course more in keeping with both the author and the character he's, he has created, both being arch tricksters. Plenty of readers have understood the final pages of Lolita as demonstrating a real change in the character of its narrator, who at the very least seems to lament the loss of a child's voice. That, however, is about as much as we can say when he remarks, Reader, reader, exclamation point. What I heard was but the melody of children at play, nothing but that, and so limpid was the air that within this vapor of blended voices, majestic and minute, remote and magically near, frank and divinely enigmatic, one could hear now and then, as if released an almost articulate spurt of vivid laughter, or the crack of a bat, or the clatter of a toy wagon, but it was all really too far for the eye to distinguish any movement in the lightly etched streets. I stood listening to that musical vibration from my lofty slope to those flashes of separate cries with a kind of demure murmur for background, and then I knew that the hopelessly poignant thing was not Lolita's ab absence from my side, but the absence of her voice from that concord. Read by Jeremy Irons, as in the Adrian Lyne film adaptation of 1997, or the more recent Random House Books on Tape version of the novel, this passage is as lyrical as can be poignant and regretful, but also fundamentally one-sided in the most un-Nabokovian manner imaginable. Sensitivity to audience, which is present throughout the narrative, but especially prominent in hortative passages like this one, makes rhetorical concerns essential. This is speech intended to move. As, as such, a little skepticism is not at all out of place, since by now we have some sense of the speaker's shifty ethos. What exactly is the sensation he describes? It could be simple nostalgia, nostalgia for all we know, rather than the regret, let alone remorse, we might like him to be experiencing. Perhaps he is merely sorry she's not a child anymore. On the other hand, this summing up is laden enough with pathos to accommodate remorse too, especially with a narrator as aware as this one. He seems to be missing something after all. Read in this way, his account could be seen as pulling no punches with regard to his own brutality and culpability toward Dolores Hayes he knows what he has done and is sorry for it. Moreover, despite Kubrick's apparent dismissal, the possibility of art artistic refuge is real in Nabokov's oeuvre, even when it is perverse. Nabokov's fictional world is moreover undeniably muse-centered, and traces of that world are evident even in the, in the distorted and morally ugly form that the novel Lolita unveils. The possibility of art as refuge in Nabokov, however, is a thin veneer of its bulk. 
in Pasternak. The argument needs to be explicitly made in the former, while in the latter it seems self-evident. Calling art mere refuge is, in fact, saying far too little for its role in Pasternak's life and work. In Dr. Zhivago, above all, where shall I put my joy is the typically momentary revelation of the, of the splendor of being alive that Pasternak believed sh could be raised by the artist to a constant poetic symptom. That's a quote. Art as a celebration of living in all its authentic mundane detail, an invitation to wake up and see afresh. It is also a response to suffering, particularly feminine suffering. This peculiar mix of symbolist impulse, art as a response to suffering, and modernist motivation, art as a way of overturning conventional perceptions of the world, is per for Pasternak not the name of a category, not an aspect of form, but a hidden mysterious part of the content of life. The content of Pasternak's envisioned world is, is mysteriously artistic. The manner in which it links the most disparate things provides a key to the many, often striking, figurative connections in his writing. Such, in fact, are the sutures that bind together a vision of the magical green world that Yuri Zhivago constantly witnesses around him. There's a quote from the novel. All the flowers smelled at once. It was as if the earth, unconscious all day long, we're now waking to their fragrance. An enormous crimson moon rose behind the crow's nest in the countess's garden. At first, it was the color of the new brick mill in Zibushina. Then it turned yellow like the water tower at Biryuchi. And just under the window, the smell of new mown hay, as perfumed as jasmine tea, mixed with that of belladonna. Below that, a cow was tethered. She had been brought from a distant village. She had walked all day. She was tired and homesick for the herd and would not yet accept food from her new mistress. Now, now, woe there, her mistress coaxed. I'll show you how to butt. But the cow crossly shook her head and craned her neck, mooing plaintively, and beyond the black horn barns of Melusieva, the stars twinkled and invisible threads of sympathy stretched between them and the cow as if they were cattle sheds in other worlds where she was pitied. Everything was fermenting, growing, rising with the magic yeast of life. The joy of living like a gentle wind swept in a, broad, in a broad surge indiscriminately through fields and towns, through walls and fences, through wood and flesh. Not to be overwhelmed by this tidal wave, Yuri Andreevich went out to the square to listen to the speeches. The lyricism of this passage, or the many others like it in the book, is not mere celebratory song, nor is it a safe capturing of landscape for consumption by a bourgeois readership. The world around Zhivago is being obliterated in sheer marvels of senseless destruction. His observations constitute acts of creation, a countermeasure of sorts that Pasternak's character at this moment in the narrative mistakenly associates with the revolution. He learns better. What he learns is already implicit in this passage, but co which contains a contrast between, on the one hand, the artistic observation of the ordinary as an inspired creative act an act that gives meaning and fullness to life, and on the other, the directed political activity of revolution, which curtails such fullness. In effect, the call to create a better life, like the speeches that subdue the tidal wave of emotion building in Zhivago, are countered by unassuming life itself, often some marvelously obscure corner of it observed inopportunely, undramatically. Countless times in the book, Zhivago, whose name it should remember, derives from the Russian word, root word for life, observes the mundane and soars. This creative act of filling the apparently empty, unifying the apparently disparate, is the most important thing Zhivago does in the book, his principal virtue. It is also likely the most difficult trait to capture cinematically, especially in the non-dramatic guise Pasternak gives it. Shots of Omar Sharif's eyes or the sounds of Maurice Jarre's swelling score do not quite manage it. In fact, they have the opposite effect turning the ordinary revelations into something too special. These are not revelations or climactic moments. I want that one. Climactic moments. Pasternak consistently deflates climaxes in his storytelling, diffusing nearly every potentially explosive encounter in the book by skipping them and informing his reader of what happened back there in some subsequent passage. According to the convention-bound creative writing industry of contemporary letters, this is simply bad storytelling. The mark of an immature writer, someone who knows how to lead up to the set piece, but shies away from delivering it. That would be a weak reading of Pasternak, who
whose hyper-Tolstoyan technique unfortunately makes his book appear inferiorly constructed. Dramatic climax, like a story that ends with a marriage or a death, or like a plot without extraneous details and only the characters you need to remember, is always contrived, always artificial. Conventional storytelling might make for good stories, but it makes for unlikely lives. Despite David Lean and Paul Bowles, who, provide Lean's, who provided Lean's screenplay, Dr. Zhivago is an experimental modernist novel, not a romance. This is why passionate observation, the hero's constant poetic symptom, rather than the trite, courageous struggle to find love against the backdrop of war and revolution, should be seen as the hero's chief virtue. Even the apparently conscious composition of the poems he leaves behind is something he suffers rather than calls forth. They come to him, overwhelm him, and he, he merely directs the flow. Now, I devote some time to this notion of artistic inspiration in the book, but I'm not going to do it here. Here, I just want to remember that the two films in question attempt two very different things. Lean, by making the book of poems the central organizing feature of his work, um, and Giacomo Campiotti, the director of the more recent BBC production, by making Yuri's poetry his first and most consistent uh, defining trait, the apparent purpose of his life, with Lara a close second and his obvious muse. Both of these miss the point of the book, but not because of any limitation of medium or technique. The problem is interpretive. The, des the desire to see the story as being primarily about a cosmically fated love turns the novel's genre inside out making Zhivago's life into something of a tool for the realization of romance, or perhaps for the creation of the Lara poems. If that is what one claims the story is mostly about, then who, who can blame contemporary readers, many of whom have been primed by reminiscences, those are their parents and grandparents in some cases, of a great love narrative if they see the character as a failure, or at least a questionable moral fiber. If this is about a man and a woman attempting to find happiness in the midst of war and revolution, the man may be a tragic testament to the revolution's fundamental inhumanity, but he falls far short of being a worthy hero. He lacks the virtuous constancy of purpose it requires, especially in his passionate loves for different women at different times. Such a lack of constancy is not a failing of Nabokov's hero in Lolita. Though some readers will surely find this an objectionable manner of characterizing Humbert Humbert's attachment and motivation. Nevertheless, Nabokov clearly suggests such a line as he too, like so many before him, invokes the recuperative trope of the woman in the window, albeit with characteristic circumspe circumspection and filtered through several layers of narrative fog when H.H. H. recounts in his diary the following. Dorsal view, glimpse of shiny skin between t-shirt and white gym shorts, bending over a windowsill, in the act of tearing off leaves from a poplar outside while engrossed in torrential talk with a newspaper boy below, parentheses, Kenneth Knight, I suspect, and parentheses, who had just propelled the Ramsdale Journal with a very precise thud onto the porch. In the window she is, and H.H. is the one seeing her, but his view is backward, skewed. As he puts it later in the same passage, I seem to see her through the wrong end of a telescope. Lest we skip lest we slip into symbolic readings, Knight, it turns out, is a classmate. He never enters the narrative again, except in the list that makes it clear he's in Lowe's school. H.H. may really think he is standing down there, so the self-conscious manipulation of the trope is probably V.N.'s, it's easy to read, Vladimir Nabokov's, alone rather than his characters. More, more important, however, is the deformation of the heroic vision that the scene suggests. The inspiring image is uncannily distant just as the inspiration linked to it is morally ugly, but it is still a vision rooted in the heroic. Here is the woman in the window. Though she is no woman and the inspired seeker is a pedophile who sees her askew and may only be imagining the boy knight looking up at her, from her to her window from below. That desire, that desire transforms the vision in, uh, is evident from earlier attempts by H.H. to peep at her through a pain only to find some seductive part of her dissolve into a man's hairy forearm. The dorsal view is a transformation of the trope akin to that performed by Dostoevsky at the end of Crime and Punishment and by Pasternak in Dr. Zhivago, but who sees Lara through a window pane. He doesn't see her, he sees a candle burning, but she's behind it, he doesn't know that. Um, but where Dostoevsky and Pasternak appear to operate within the dichotomies of whore versus Madonna, or as Laura Mulvey has put it, the voyeuristic and the fetishistic, Nabokov's treatment questions the position of the viewer, and by extension, the reader, more fundamentally. 
The inspired viewer inside the book, Humbert Humbert, may very well sense that he sees the woman in the window incorrectly somehow, at least he says as much. But the fact that his is the only voice through which we viewers outside the book experience his inspired gaze, his extended contemplation of the beloved object, implicates us as well. We see her, think of her, only through his depiction, his manipulation. He clothes her, makes her talk for us, act for us. He gives her expressions, gestures, emotions. There is no Lolita, as if this were her name, without the collection of graphemes he sets running along the page of his diary in this passage and everywhere else. We are implicated by our readerly consent from the moment we, get, we begin accepting these symbols as representing something, the girl and the man who make this story so beautiful and so ugly. Let's see. Nabokov's critique of the minor reader in us is perfectly apropos. He says uh, people who identify with characters in books are minor readers. I think by association with minor characters. He's making fun of Americans mostly. This is nothing morally there is nothing morally objectionable about this story as long as we agree that it refers to no thing, no person. Thus, when Leland de la Durante in his 2007 book, Style is Matter, laments that Lolita, quote, is everywhere referred to, everywhere described, everywhere po poetically loved, but of her thoughts and feelings, Humbert, of, Humbert offers us scarce a glimpse, end quote. Whatever specific point he may be trying to bring home, in this case, I think that H.H. will not see things from her point of view, must be preceded by the recognition that, technically speaking, she does not have any thoughts or feeling, feelings, not until we give them to her, not until we allow him to give them to her for us. This is as true of H.H. H. H. as it is of V.N. Whatever inspiration, or if you are a pervert too, whatever titillation you might experience at the depiction Nabokov provides is dependent upon your willingness to see the fiction as representing something, someone. The play upon our sensibility is palpable. When Humbert, as if that were his, his name, catches up with Lowe on the street in Elphinstone after the, she appears to have given him the slip in chapter 19, he questions her closely on what she has been doing, where she has been for the past several minutes. On quickly checking her excuses, he ends up standing with her in front of a shop window where she claims to have been looking at dresses with a friend. This is what they see. It was indeed a pretty sight. A dapper young fellow was vacuum cleaning a carpet of sorts upon which stood two figures that looked as if some blast had just worked havoc with them. One figure was stark naked, wigless and armless, its comparatively small stature and smirking pose suggested that when clothed, it had represented, and would represent when clothed again, a girl child of Lolita's size. But in its present state, it was sexless. Next to it stood a much taller veiled bride, quite perfect and intacta, except for the lack of one arm. On the floor at the feet of these damsels where the man, scrawled, when, where the man crawled about laboriously with his cleaner, there lay a cluster of three slender arms and a blonde wig, Two of the arms happened to be twisted and seemed to suggest a clasping gesture of horror and supplication. Look low, I said quietly. Look well. Is not that a rather good symbol of something or other? Humbert immediately darts off to another topic, leaving Nabokov's your symbol here announcement apparently undeveloped. So let us see what we can do. Sexless girl child, naked and formless, without protection. She has no arms, but also without animation. The ultimate in plasticity, she is plastic. Waiting to be clothed and reordered by the man at her feet. Second damsel, adult woman figure, also inanimate, adorned as bride by the man at her feet. And the man at her feet, a mere shop clerk, one who dresses up the figures for others to look at, admire, be inspired by. One be inspired by, order their lives around through the window. And who is looking now? Broken girl child and the parody of a father, parody of a lover, parody of a husband at her feet, clothing and reordering her for himself and for us. Kubrick manages the iconicity of the latter relationship elegantly in his opening credits, which feature a man's hands in the act of deftly painting a young woman's or child's toenails at her feet, serving her, dressing her up in private for presentation to a public. Here, moreover, the trope has morphed yet again with attendant layers of representation and, in effect, an unmasking of the, the objectifying gaze. If one response to the pictured woman is to lament her absence of agency, give her roundness, and convert the trope into a character, Nabokov's move 
here does the opposite, stripping the trope completely of its person-like veneer and clarifying as a result what we are all doing here, dressing up figures and pretending together that they are persons. The former nudges art into morality, the latter pulls the two apart. The scene's magic derives from the delicate play between the two realms, which depend on each other and form the marvelous duplicity it encourages, and from the mar marvelous duplicity it encourages in readers who can understand very well that they are referring to no one, but no matter how many times they remember this, can continue to feel compassion and remorse the moment these no ones are made to dance. Thank you. Thank you very much for that talk. We have time for questions, and um, I'll just sit here and make sure you see yeah, hands I as they I think go I can up, see everybody. but the floor is open. I guess, yes, and he's absolutely really, really aware of Chernyshevsky at the time. And, and that it also makes it ironic that he would use, that he would give self-interest as a positive trait. It's another layer of irony, because on one hand, you have self-interest associated with commercial self-interest, which is not something that you would think Levin would be in support of. And then you have self-interest as rational self-interest, which is the variety you're talking about. Right, these, these radi left radicals with whom he also didn't agree on many occasions. I mean, he was sort of a, an anchor, he was a free thinker, iconoclastic thinker. In some, th in some ways he did agree with them, but he didn't like the way they went about things. And class-wise, he's in a completely different category. And he's, class-wise, he is known as a, an up, someone who upholds the, landed gen the values of the landed gentry. And so, the, so that's where I come to self-interest as, a, as a, a, a Republican idea, where uh, it's all, it's, it, as you reach back to Machiavelli, the idea that um, Rome was so strong because it had people who would fight for their land. Right? These Republican, natural Republican agents, they were people who owned estates. And that's a lot like Levin's idea, that he's, he's, not, he's not siding with this commercial self-interest, and he's not siding with this rational self-interest crowd, which is radical, more radical than he wants to be at this part of his life. He's, he's going way back to a kind of Machiavellian idea, almost, that, that he, he's, a, he's a landed nobleman, and he has a responsibility, but it's not the responsibility of this newfangled government apparatus that they're trying to shove on top of them with the Zemstva and all those things. And so he's thinking about it from a much more radical standpoint. So he's thinking, for instance, of the peasant, not as a collective thing, but as an element of natural, the natural environment. Remember, he's trying to write a book about the peasant, peasant as something like the climate. The peasant is another aspect of Russian, what, riches, wealth. And he wants to write about it in that way, which is a very unusual idea. It's almost like the peasant is a per isn't a person, it's part of the right, natural environment. But tapping into their self-interest so that they right. can stay aligned better. So it's a, it's right. trying to co-opt. That's right, and, other that's right. and they feed then his self-interest, because <laughs> he's now responsible for them. As a Republican agent, they're on his land. He's the pater familias of the people on his land. So he's, he's a Republican. I think it's very, very, it's a Russian transformation of that old Machiavellian Republican idea. Which may have never existed in real, in Rome for I mean as a as a real thing Machiavelli thought it did but that's why he thought the Romans were so strong and the Republic. Christina, I'm involved in the Parlor game. 
Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what came to mind, you explored the image from the two ends of the telescope, you know, from looking at the woman in the window and looking from inside. And I found that very compelling. And I thought of these two uh, kind of iconic examples that, um, that go from one perspective to the other. And uh, it's that opening shot in Psycho that um, goes from outside and goes through the window. Yeah. And it's not the woman in the window, but we get to inside the room. Um, and that's really a quotation from the Gabriel Cox, um, mm -hmm. Man with a Movie Camera, where we have the camera penetrate inside um, this uh, bedroom of a yeah. woman and wake her up, and then she goes to the window and she opens her eyes and you know she opens the shade. So I was wondering about that mobility of the camera and this um, kind of shift of perspectives. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I, it made it into th this, I, this idea of, um, I think it has something to do with privacy. I think it has something to do with privacy and, um, and uh, views of people in public. Um, I was reading, and I and made it into the book a little bit, um, Senate's book, The Fall of Public Man. Um, and it made me think a lot, actually, to go back to Anna Karenina, it made me think of the last portions of Anna Karenina when Anna is about to commit suicide and she's walking, sorry if I spoiled the book for people. Uh, she's about to, <laughs> she's about to, it's, it's still good. <laughs> she's, a, she's about to commit suicide and she's walking around and feeling extremely self-conscious. She's feeling like everyone is looking at her. And it's this, it's this very strange sort of um, beginning of, uh, you imagine walking through a, a transparent building today with all the glass and people seeing you. And she is not used to it. She's, it's a train station. Obviously, she's walking in a train station, which is a public place. And I think that there, there are, there's this moment at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century when they're, they're kind of exploring this idea uh, of privacy and public, pu pu what, the public um, public viewing of people, and that the camera then enables them to do it even more. I think the camera is an extension of that same exploration that is happening already. And then, then they get cameras, and then they say, "Oh, look, we can do this." And then they go in the windows and, and do this, the sort of thing that you mentioned. But I haven't thought it through that much. This is a hunch. It's more of a hunch than a thesis at this point. It's something I think might be happening. Uh, yeah, we have two. One and two. Um, maybe in the same vein as with your last comment. I, I'm thinking about something, and I'm not exactly sure how to connect it to what you said about the two film adaptations of Lolita, mm -hmm. which is that there, the strange power that that film seems to have to leave a kind of permanent mark on the professional lives of the actresses who play huh. the Lolita character. Um, I know that Sue White felt that it kind of ruined her career to play Lolita, and Dominic Swain went on to do mostly softcore porn after making that movie. Mm -hmm. and, um, obviously, it hasn't had a similar impact on Jeremy Irons or James Mason or Frank Langella or Peter S you know. No. And and I wonder how that could be a kind of seen as a kind of extension of something of how the reader and viewer relationship that you were talking about. Um, yeah. Somehow I don't know exactly what to make of that, but, it's, but I think it's something that's really always intrigued me about the sort of rendering of that book in film, that it takes, it then kind of bleeds over into you know, all these other movies into the way. Yeah, I don't, I don't know either, but I, I mean it could be, could be connected. I don't know, but I, it, the, but the idea of, again, the public rendering of something, uh, maybe more than private. It's private and and, and uh, harmful um, because adults, you know, when you get adults adjusting to the public sphere, mm -hmm. they adjust uh, if they don't commit suicide, mm -hmm. uh, like Anna, and and that becomes something mundane. We're all used to that now. I mean, it's, it's 
in fact, we're used to it in the way that we see these women from inside, and we think, oh, that's a normal, that's a woman at the women window. Um, and that, and I think of that as the opposite of the normal one, at least historically speaking, it wasn't the normal at a certain point. So I don't know where to go with the, the question of the actor, actress, actors themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, yeah. We have one in the middle and then one in the back, yeah. Yeah, um, well, I thought of Tatiana as the woman at the window. She's always shown at the window, and in a lot of writings by women in the 19th century, women in this, that seems to be a, a trope, the, you know, the woman in the window. Um, and then this is Julia and Rapunzel. And I was wondering, and I, I seem to remember um, paintings of the Annunciation, where Mary is at the window, and the little homunculi are coming in through. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it's, it's a real, I mean, looking at it from a feminist perspective, it's very, very interesting trope. Yeah. So yeah, that that list is that list is good, and, and there are, there are quite a few more. Um, there are quite a few more. Um, there are a lot of them actually. There, uh, you mentioned the paintings of Mary. There are a lot of Venetian paintings. Uh, I think it had to do with Venetian architecture. Uh, with and, and references to the window and women in windows in Venice, uh, uh, you can imagine that, right? With the, the canal and, the, and the, the 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 window looking out onto the canal, and um, and then um, there was another one you mentioned. Oh yeah, uh, Tatiana. Actually, that that made me smile because uh, Carol Emerson, when she knew I was writing this book for a long time, and she often referred to it as my Tatiana book, even though I I didn't. I don't treat Tatiana. This is you're talking about Eugene Onegin and Tatiana and Eugene Onegin, and uh, I don't treat her in there. But yes, she's in there. <laughs> is it, uh, as is, I do treat uh, Lisa from uh, the Queen of Spades. It's a it's a more mm, I suppose a more blatant example because there's a man down there looking at her on purpose, <laughs> using the trope to manipulate her. In effect, um, yeah. But they're quite a quite a few. There's Master Margarita has her framed at one point, and there are quite a few. The books I have are the woman feels suffocated and needing, you know, her, her being actually kept from the outside. And then, you know, when I first heard the title of your book, I mean, the book of a prostitute, but that's the only way you know, sale. You know, I'm not sure if this isn't a prostitute. Yeah. Uh, she's rather scantily clad for um, early 19th century painting. It do, I don't know. I looked. I looked up the history of the painting. It doesn't say that it's a prostitute. It just calls the woman at the window. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. But so yes, it, it, on yes, it's a, it's a display, um, as opposed to a a, a a a shelter of some kind or a, um, a hiding concealment, right? So in a in, depending on genre, right? You can imagine, like in um, I believe in the. When the girl with the dragon tattoo is that the Stieg Larsson adaptation. There's a there's a window and there's somebody behind it and I think it's a woman, but it's a completely different image and a different feel, different tone to what she's doing back there. Something maybe perhaps demonic about it. Well, um, I think you know, what you said about the public and private and where women fit into that is really interesting. You know, if you think of the domestic sphere and yeah. So thank yeah. You very much. yeah. There's a question in the back. I'm just curious, um, just about your last part and something about your title of why why it's about consensual desire um, rather than non consensual. <laughs> yeah. Particularly, in part, well, for two reasons with my book. One, um, just a, a, one, just the sort of obvious thing with Lolita and Humbert, um, but. But also, I was thinking, there's so many men in windows in the book, where right, and so Kimbo and Shade and, and Illusion sort of constantly being framed within windows. And, and so I was just wondering, it's sort of clear there's scenes of desire or frustrated desire. Yeah. Um, but is the consensual aspect because it has a kind of economic? Um, I was trying to figure out how to tie together the perspective. So is I see. It, so consensual it's consensual consensualism. So consensual. It's not consensual desire. It's consensual fantasy. Fantasy, yeah. Sorry. Right, and so into that category. So this consensual fantasy is 
the symbolic. It's the it's in that category is where you get credit. It's where you get language. It's where you get money. Anything that we are agreeing about that doesn't really in its material form have that is consensual fantasy. Right? So we're, I'm throwing out these words into the air. Up here somewhere you're catching them and we're agreeing that they mean something. Same with the paper and the banknotes in the double, right? And digital the digital numbers that end up in my bank account. Right? And so those that, that's all consensual fantasy. So that's a middle term between the virtuous ideal at the beginning, which is landed and propertied, and virtuality at the end, where you've got all this fantasy gone crazy, gone wild. And there's plenty of non-consensual stuff going on at the other end. Actually, at both ends, there's non-consensual stuff. But but consensual fantasy is the middle term. It's like a it's like a thing that's driving. This is the way I imagine it. It's a it's a drive belt for change, and it's it's something that I was following as I went, um, that I thought was there all the time. Consensual fantasy. Oh, there it is again. It's underneath, um, and I thought of it as a as the as a kind of under girding of the modern world. The, the modern world being the world where commerce takes off. Commerce and agreements of, about like commerce take off. Before that, you have a very different set of relationships and you have the medieval village, let's say. And they have commerce, but it's not as widespread. And the aristocracy doesn't even necessarily engage in it. Whereas when they come to engage in it in the 19th century, it's a very troubling thing for them. This is, what, this is one of the things that I think the Russians have the biggest problem with. Because who was engaging in art? The gentry. Gentry was making art. And if you mix art and money, Russians say bad, bad, bad. <laughs> and it, uh, it, outside of that, outside of Russia, it was already accepted. It was professional. It was a professionalization of art had already taken place 50, 60, 100 years before. Because the Russians were really struggling with it. And Dostoevsky struggled with it terribly. Yes. So then to clarify, so this is in a way, the consensus here is that we, we in a sense, all traffic in representation. And or by the very, so that the novel, in a sense, is, or these various works find as their kind of total sign, the total of the woman in, in the window. And so in, um, oh yeah. As a, as a kind of compensation almost, right? Because once you embrace that world of consensual fantasy, anything means whatever you want. It's just an agreement. We're all in a stock market at that point. And the values go up and down no matter of it. So you need something to anchor. And these guys need something to anchor. That's, this is where the, the, the idea comes from and why I think she's there so much. And, the, the, and women too and at certain points, like Sonia. Why does she see? Raskolnikov up there, savior. I think what senior is still struggling about for money, actually. So I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Dickens and Bleak House, ravenous pens, taking people's identities and taking people's portraits. Or actually, I thought a lot about Wordsworth, you know, and interest. But actually, what I, I, I was thinking, I thought Diana was going to go somewhere else with that. And at the risk of sounding very essentialist, um, what about like her menopause? That comes to mind immediately. She has poems with women's. And I think there is a difference as a woman trying to present herself as a writer and as an artist, she's deliberately using that trope differently. And the other example that's in my head is this, because I just happened to have seen it at this artist's 1962 film, Cleo from Five to Seven. Mm -hmm. Wonderful scene of, of Cleo trying on hats and the, the, the between what you call it, the shop window. And I, there was something different going on there because it was Agnes Varda and not Jean the daughter in front of you. That, that she was looking at that woman in the window at that and trying to do something different. So that's just to say, I mean, that yes. would be, I don't know how many Russian examples we have, but I think Carolina Pavlova would be interesting, and I thought maybe that's where you were going. You know, a way to take this trope in the modern world, but, but to be oriented. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, women writers and women artists are yeah. going to look at that, are, are using that, that's why I, I was sounding essentialist here. Yeah. That, that, that there's something. It's not essentialist, it's cultural. You know, if you right. think of our, our bands from the outside world, then the window is, is the escape. Right? They use it in the program. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. What kind of yeah. Yeah. No, or, I mean, 
I, I want to push that. I want to push that further. Yeah, so that, that I would put into the category of uh, it's a response. It's one of the two. So there are two responses to the trope, right? It was, as I said at the end, there are two responses to the trope. One is to say these, this is an empty, empty trope, and, and these characters don't have any. They, they're, they're just manipulated. They're just flat. So why don't we give them agency? Let's, let's make a round character. And so that's one response. And so you take that. It could be a feminist or just a writer. I mean, anybody could do that. Let's, let's make a character here as opposed to uh, something that is just anchoring for these guys and, and doesn't have any other value. And the other is to do sort of what Nabokov chose, and he did it, I think, pretty much consistently, not just in this depiction. But to show us actually that it's a trope, <laughs> and and pull it apart and say, look, you, you, it doesn't exist unless we allow it to. And you're you're an unsophisticated reader for not seeing that. You 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 people who had identified with characters, um, yeah. So uh, I don't see that as essentialist either. I see it as yeah. It's, yeah, it's true. Um, for the Dostoevsky uh, Society panel at next to AC's. Uh, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do two more versions of this. <laughs> I can't stop now because, <laughs> as we noticed, it's pretty widespread. But uh, the two are um, uh, so um, uh, a short story by Dostoevsky called "The Meek One, Krotkaya." She jumps out of it, <laughs> and uh, it's told by the man. Again, it's a story narrated by a man. She escapes. How does she escape? She commits suicide by throwing herself out the window. Um, and then, if you start, if you if you think about now women falling out of windows, what do you think of uh, Daniel Harms, uh, who has women falling out of windows, <laughs> old women falling out of windows, and in his notebooks he has as a way of designating his love interest, whose name was Elena, I believe, Elena, Elena, no, yeah, Elena. He uses an E like this, and then he starts finishing it off, and it's, it's a window, it's a, and he uses that instead of her name all the way through. This is his love interest. So he's basically not only essentialized her. <laughs> He's made her into a symbol of a window. Um, and so those two things together, I think I, I haven't thought them through, but there, there's plenty to say about those two things. It, it, it's, a, it's a trope that seems to have, um, have a, a life of its own. So Carolina Pavlovna could be next. Or you could do it. <laughs> I actually had a question that's to some degree about um, reception and serialization. So when you're looking at um, these works that were serialized in the thick journals, do you see them as being in dialogue with other, say, nonfiction works having to do with economics, since it's a moment when you know so many people are, are trying to figure out what credit is, yeah. things like that? Yeah. So yeah, there's a, yeah, two things. Um, well, there's an epigraph to a piece by Chernyshevsky that I used. It's about it's straightforward economics. It's not even from one of his best well-known yeah. pieces. It's just something he wrote about economics and the spread of economic knowledge and ideas about economics. And I'm thinking about just words and, and yeah. concepts that are associated with with um, kind of new social science, um, which may may or may not have been econom called economics, but that was associated with. Wait. So you're saying you you use a passage from. From a chair sure, sure, as an epigraph to one of my sections, to, uh -huh, to, to uh -huh. a, a little one on, on Dostoevsky. So it's in there, and I do think that they are in dialogue. Um, um, uh, I, I could do a lot more with it. I, I didn't want to, nor did I want to have too much Chernyshevsky in this book. Um, he's not very interesting. Uh, I guess I wasn't thinking actually about Chernyshevsky so much as all of the um, other kind of like introductory pieces for the public that yeah. you find in these thick journals that will be like, this is how a bank works, this is what credit is. And um, it's really interesting to see them next to some of the literary texts. Right, right. Because um, right. I and think you're absolutely right that this is 
this is precisely the transition that they're negotiating basically from real estate identity to credit identity. Yeah, so, so things that we might, we might read right past, they might have noticed, actually. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so there's a passage, the, the famous, pa the most famous passage in Ancredina is the, is the adulterer as murderer scene where uh, Vronsky and Anna have just consummated their relationship and he and she, their thoughts are sort of intertwined and he, he has this very macabre sort of uh, language about how she's crying on his shoulder and he's saying it's okay, it's okay, but the murderer must, the, even the murderer that has just killed his victim must hack up the body and hide it somewhere. Right? He's got to, but inside that, he's got an economic metaphor. What had been purchased with the price of her shame? That's what had been purchased with the price of her shame. And I think we read right through it because purchasing and all of that, we're just so used to it. But I think that they might have noticed something like that. Yeah. Um, and, and I think anytime you're buying something in Tolstoy, you know, red yeah. lights go off, it's probably bad. <laughs> um, which is not the case, you know, as they ask you say, in Gogol necessarily. I mean, maybe it's asking you to pay attention, for example, right. if you get a money amount. But in Tolstoy, it's quite likely to be bad, I think, unless you're dealing with either, unless you're so rich that essentially there's no such thing as money, you know, like Pierre, um, in which case, you know, you don't have to worry, you're not implicated, or yeah. you're so poor that you're dealing with these little, like you're trading rags, yeah. in which case you're also outside the system. But the system itself, which involves counting, treating, bureaucracy, mediation, it's always bad. Right, and that, I think that harkens back to this, it's a medieval idea about the aristocratic virtue. You, the mm -hmm. knights never handled money. Yeah. And if they did, they just tossed it, right? Because it's dirty. It's dirty. It's what tradesmen do, not what nobles do. This Although, is also, there's an anti-Semitic aspe aspect yeah, to this too, right? Nice. Obviously, in, in Dostoevsky, in, 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 all the way through, handling of money is dirty. And I also think that to some degree, um, and maybe this is sort of what Melissa was trying to talk about, to some degree in Anna Karenina, we're invited to see that Levin's, there, there are problems with his self-presentation and you know, serious problems with the claims that he makes for being an integrated person. And um, I'm not, not sure, yeah, I'm not sure that we're supposed to sort of assume that, oh, well, I'm just, what is he, somebody says, who are you? And he says, well, I'm just Constantine Levin. That's just who I am. Um, I'm, I'm just not so convinced. I don't know. There's going to be a crisis, right? And Tolstoy's going to have a big crisis, you know, which one could argue that not was about. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's really wonderful to tie that um, idea of firmness, strength, integralness to real estate. <laughs> and I really would say real estate, not land. Right, it's, it's property, it's a yeah. certain, certain conception yeah. of land, yeah. Peasants have land, Levin, he has real estate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's really fascinating. Any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you so much, this was My extremely pleasure. interesting. Thank you for coming.